Yes, sir. Yes. I can do yeah. that. Okay. Right. Ready. Owe Kaiser. Owe Kaiser. Is that good enough? Not loud enough. Not loud enough. Owe Kaiser. Owe Kaiser. Yeah. All right. Well, about to take that. The next thing we do is we salute the emperor. So we take our right hand, that hand. Right. We've got a fist. We do it like a fist and we bring it down to our chest <coughs> because we're giving this is our sword arm and we're giving our sword arm our fighting arm to the emperor and we touch our heart so we go like that and then we push it out and we open our fists out like that somebody stole that from us a lot later on but we got it first so i will do it to you and you will do it to me. Do you understand? Yes! yes. Do you understand? Yes! Who's, this, who's that one with? That little one that with the pinky. Who's that one with? I think she's... We all want to take her home. <laughs> right, so, I will give you a salute. Right, again. That's all right. Now the hard bit, we do the two together. So I will go. If you're down this side, you're cheering for the Iron Age British. Oh, we're, yeah, we're the British, we're cheering for the British. That's what we do. Now do bear with me, I don't have a PA system, I'll try and project my voice as much as possible. We are a society called Britannia and we've been very, very lucky to be invited here today uh, on this fantastic project. We're very, very fortunate to work with these lovely groups. And uh, Britannia, we've, uh, we've worked for the last 31 years. And uh, as well as the university, first of all, we'll see what these Praetorians are all about. Rockety, two! Six, 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 Someone's not been doing drill up to you! <laughs> <laughs>
The magistrate, Marcus Januarius, takes the tribute. A percentage will go back to Rome. It is also a gesture of friendship between the local tribe and Rome itself. Now I think there's some more dialogue to be had. They say, magistrates, they come... Oh! The centurion has taken a liking to the chieftain's gold talk. It has made them very nervous, and the centurion Praetorians are also very nervous in this This meeting is going a bit wrong. Incidentally, the gold talks are worn by the Iron Age British chieftains and eventually get phased out in the first century AD and re emerge in a later Roman army. It's almost like the style hadn't quite gone. Magistrates! They come in peace, but they want to see the might of Rome. They suggest a competition, a feat of arms. A competition between the British and Rome. We challenge you to competition. Choose your events. Oh, first of all, a demonstration will be archery. Magistrate, they fancy themselves as sagittari, archers. I'd wager Roptio's daughter could beat this lot. What say you? Let her take part. The Romans have so much contempt for the Iron Age British, they're sending the cavalryman's daughter 
to compete. Down with Italy. Down with Italy. Come on, England. Come on, England. Don't listen to him. in all fairness. Um, <laughs> let's have... Um, we can't lose face. We can't no. lose face. What should we do? How about a bloodless battle where we can show these barbarians what we're all about? A mock battle then to show our might. Should we give them a mock battle? Yeah! yeah. Praetorians! Praetorians! Make ready! You should go for the beer tent. You should talk to someone here. What are you doing, man? Three years. Hang on. Get all this going on. Oh, 
afterwards we welcome you and of course Rome's influence on Britain grew it became not just a series of kingdoms but one island nation the identity of Britannia was formed in a Roman era these are the Romano British ladies and gentlemen we are Britannia thank you because we had stopped expanding. At this point, the empire is no longer trying to conquer. It has conquered everything worthwhile. So instead, we want to defend our territory. That means that there are two types of soldiers in our army. There are the border guards, the Roman equivalent of the TA. Their job is to spend their weekends playing soldier and fighting off any barbarians who try to encroach upon our borders. The other type of soldier is the field army soldier. He is a professional soldier working 24-7 as a member of the Roman military. He is drilled and trained to perfection and his job is to kill any barbarians who do break through the border. These behind me are men of the field army. They are skilled at one thing and one thing only, annihilating the enemy. The kind of opponents these men face are Germans, Goths, some Huns and some Persians, if you are in the eastern sphere of the empire as well. So they have a wide variety of opponents. Their fighting style is also more flexible, and this is reflected in their equipment. Two of our legionaries are wearing mail. Some people call it chain mail. There is actually nothing to do with chains involved in the construction whatsoever. But the Romans called it Lorica Hamata. Some of the earlier legionaries were wearing this. You can see in our standard bearer and our archer that the sleeves are longer, the male coat reaches further down his body. So it is an advancement of the design to provide more protection without sacrificing any of his mobility, as this is a flexible type of armor that allows him to fight in a more loose style. Our army doesn't necessarily fight in large blocks of men, shield to shield in a giant shield wall all the time, although we can do that. These men are also trained to fight in one-on-one -on -one combat, in light scouting operations, and to take out any troops that come over the borders without having to line up in a giant army of 5,000. Because our armies are slightly smaller, maybe only 1,000 men in a legion, sometimes only 500. But this allows them to move more rapidly. The other type of armor you can see behind you is the scale armor on our officer in the middle. Again, the earlier Romans had scale and the design has not changed very much as it is already ideally suited for our purpose. Some scales are longer, some scales are shorter, but it does the exact same job. Both of these, as well as the chain mail, sorry, the mail, <laughs> caught myself there, as well as the mail are designed to stop the cutting edge of weapons or to stop spears from stabbing into you. Underneath this, we have padding which you can just see poking out from underneath the mail on the left and attached to the padding are these decorative strips terrigays that mark you out as an important man or an officer but the padding underneath is most important because this blocks the blows of the blunt the blunt force trauma of the weapons as they hit you so their armor is more flexible their clothing you also notice is more decorative our officer in the middle there and myself have long sleeved tunics made out of linen, wool or silk with decorative patterns on them. The late Roman style in general was influenced by the military and military tunics are often shown as being highly decorative. 
Some of them wear plain tunics because the mail that they're wearing will shred the decorations on it as it's loads of tiny, tiny little links. But for the most part, the Roman army tended to wear very flashy decorative clothes in bright colors. Around everybody's waist, you can also see a military belt. This is either referred to as a baltius or a kingulum. To the Romans, the word means the same thing. But for most of us, we think of those military belts, when we say kingulum, with the affectionate dangly bits around the front. These are designed to intimidate the foe. For a legion of 5,000 men marching forward in time, or jingling as they march, is certainly going to put the fear of the Roman army into the barbarian. By the later period, this has become a wider belt. Looks a little bit like a weightlifter's belt. The added advantage here is that it, it helps you to spread the weight of the armour around your body. It doesn't jingle as we walk, <laughs> even if you do try and do some acrobatic manoeuvres, <laughs> which I won't ask you to do today. <laughs> but these longer belts signify one thing. This means you are a member of the Roman army or a member of the civil service. You see a man wearing one of these, even if he doesn't have armor on or a helmet or weapons, you know that this man is a member of the Roman military. With that belt on, he is allowed to requisition bed, board, food from any citizens. He is, he is uh, I've forgotten the word, um, he is stationed with in the town. Um, he can walk into your house and say, you're going to provide me food and drink for the evening because I'm a member of the Roman army. And if you don't do it, you will either be fined, imprisoned, or I will have you turned into a slave. Underneath the belt, you'll also see that the men are wearing trousers. Well, two out of three are wearing trousers. Considered barbaric by the early Romans, who of course have their short tunics with their legs exposed, trousers have become more of a fashion in the later empire. Partly because we're conquering a lot of places, or we've already conquered a lot of places, and need to hang around where it's very cold, such as Hadrian's Wall. It's not comfortable hanging around in Scotland at two o'clock in the morning in December. So the trousers help keep you warm. They also help you, for, they also prevent you from being entangled in thorns and briar and bushes and getting scratched and scraped as you're marching across rough terrain. If you don't have trousers, you might have a pair of leg wraps like these on as well. These are again just used to make sure that your legs, are remain, uh, your legs remain injury free as you're walking through rough terrain. Finally, the boots. You can see that these boots are taller, same height as the earlier legionaries over here, but they're a little bit taller than the caligae, the sandals that most of the earlier legionaries would have worn. As with the early Romans, these boots have got hobnails in the bottom to make sure that you do not slip and slide when you're tracking over the rough terrain and mud. And you might, if you're particularly wealthy, as I unfortunately am, have a long, tall pair of decorative boots like these. These would perhaps be reserved for either very senior army officers or for the emperor himself. In terms of their weaponry, you can see that this legionary in the middle is armed with a long thrusting spear. Rather than trying to close into close quarters and use the short sword that the early legionaries have, this man is trained to fight from a larger distance. He wants to keep the opponent at least the length of his spear away. Next to him is an archer. At any time, one third of the late Roman army was equipped as foot archers. This man's job is to kill the opponent before his comrade needs to use his spear. You can see he's got a recurved bow as it curves in on itself. These are adapted from designs made by the Huns, made by the Scythians, horse riding tribes from the steppes. So one third of the legion will be equipped as an archer the remaining two-thirds will be equipped as close combat infantry. Both of these men and the standard bearer and myself also carry another backup weapon, the sword. In our period, the sword is again longer than the gladius. This is called a spada, the late Roman cutting sword. The extra length allows the legionary to fight more flexibly as he can reach further around his shield, which is smaller and rounder than the big earlier scutums and all legionaries are equipped with one of these. Perhaps as well they would have maybe a fighting knife or even a mace in case the enemy got too close, but the ideal way of fighting for the late Roman army is to keep the opponent at a distance with ranged weapons. Bows, siege weapons, ballistas, 
javelins, we have two different types of javelins, we have throwing darts, we might have had throwing axes as well, as some of those have appeared in the record. Whether the Romans used them we can't be sure, but they certainly existed. Once you've got through all that, spear, finally get down to the sword, and if that fails it might be time to turn and run. The standard over there, as you can see, bears the same design as the shield in the centre. This is based on an original Roman document called the Notitia Dignitatum, which basically was a list of all the army units in existence. The roster recorded whereabouts they were stationed in the world, what their insignia looked like, and gives us a rough idea of their job. So the text on the banner, as you can see, reads Aoviani Signores, which translates roughly to the senior regiment in the service of Jupiter, or in the name of Jupiter. They are classed as a Palatini Regiment, which means a Palace Guard level regiment. The best equivalent I can give you is that these men represent the 4th century equivalent of perhaps the Coldstream Guards, or the House Guards, or the Life Guards. These are men in direct service to the Emperor himself. They are commanded by a very, very senior officer, usually of noble birth, and their job is to sit in Italy and wait until they're told to muster and go and kill some barbarians. But this design on the shield not only allows us as reenactors to learn something about the unit in battle it allows us to uh, in the in battle it would allow the commander to know where his units were where his men were make sure nobody was out of position and reposition his army if necessary the crested device on the helmet in the middle the feathers may also have been used for this purpose we don't know exactly when and where they used uh, crests like this, but they have been found and they are depicted in relevant artwork. So a working theory is that the crest is worn by a senior soldier or an officer who needs his men to know where he is at all times so that they can form up on him. So this man, a bit like the centurion, would use the device on top of his head so that his men would be able to follow him into battle or reposition if they were out of place. Uh, <clears throat> trying to think of anything else to run through. It's different. Or what they, what they would do with these is so th this this is a sixty two. So the war bows are like reel a bit of these. <laughs> so what's the what's the full on the sort of front of it? So plus that's two, right so, in front so of this it. is this so this is a sixty pound draw weight to get to full draw, which is usually about twenty eight inches. So a war bow is <laughs> two hundred pound draw pull to twenty eight inches. Yeah yeah, old Each. English long <laughs> bowmen <laughs> would have one shorter arm and one longer arm due to the, yeah, like, to the shoulder.